Welcome all to tonight's talk, Friday Night Halaqa, and today really I have a topic that is that is very unique, and it's very telling that no matter what the circumstance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give guidance to whom He wills, where He wills, and how He wills. Tonight, I want to discuss with you the story of a man by the name of Anselm Termida. Now this sounds like a strange name and it is for Islamic names or Muslim names at least if there is something called Muslim names this is a strange name but this is the name of a man who grew up in who was born in the city of Mallorca in Spain not central Spain but rather in an island that is known as Mallorca. Even today, hundreds of years later, it's still known as Mallorca as well. In Arabic, this area is known as Mallorca. So this man, later on, he became known as al Mayoraqi. He was born to a Christian father, and he was born in the year approximately 758 after the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or in the common era 1357. So uh, the reason why I'm approximating a date is because we don't necessarily know exactly uh, what that date was, but approximately because through his works, we can kind of see that he's saying at this year, I'm this much. So from that, if we do the math, we can get an approximate date. Maybe it might be 757, it might be 756, but approximately 758, okay? And he lived until 832. And he himself told us his life story. So we don't have too many biographers speaking of him. But the writings of this man, there's one main writing of this man. It is used by historians as a source as well for history. He talks about his own life in the first chapter of a book art he wrote. Now I won't tell you what that book is until later. But he spoke about his own life in there. And he tells us that he's originally from the city of Mallorca and uh, again it's a small island uh, south of Spain and this was an island by the way which was also under Muslim rule as well so whenever we think of Al-Andalus right Andalusia sometimes we think of Islam only within there but you have to keep in mind that a number of islands south in the Mediterranean Sea were also under Muslim rule among which happens to be Sicily and people generally don't talk about Islam in Sicily or Islam in Mallorca because the, I mean, in Sicily, there's still some books on it, but this particular region, there's really not that much uh, written on it. But there was Islam for some uh, time from the year 847 CE to, till 1232 CE. This was an era that was largely of Muslim rule within this region. But notice 1232 and the birthday or the birth year of this man, 1357, there is 125 years between the two. So he's born after the Muslim reign in this area. Okay? Right now, this, this island, it's largely a Christian island, and his father sent him off as a young child to study the Bible under some famous priests, priests of his time. At the age of six, he began to memorize the Bible. Literally, memorize the Bible. And... He memorized in two years half of the Bible. By the way, there is a practice of memorizing the Bible as well, just as there is a practice of memorizing the Quran. Only the memorizers of the Quran far outnumber the memorizers of the Bible. But there is a practice nonetheless of memorizing the Bible. So this young man had memorized half of the Bible in two years. After he finished this course of memorizing the Bible, he started studying the language and the intricacies of the Bible and he started studying logic as well for six years consecutively. So from eight till 14, he's studying. Basically, he's a student of knowledge, but he's a student of knowledge of Christianity. He then moves out from Mallorca to another city that is known as Leada, which is again a city in central Spain. So he leaves now southern uh, the southern island to go to central Spain to a place which is around 1.5 hours of drive from Barcelona. And there he remains 
And he starts to study more Christianity. He wants to basically become an expert scholar within Christianity. He studies astrology. He st studies uh, other sciences. He goes for another course in Bible studies for another four years. This is, by the way, this region at that point is known to be one of the primary places to study Christianity. But that's not enough. This is a real student of knowledge and, and he has a thirst of knowledge. But of course, knowledge of Christianity. He then moves to another city called uh, Pamplona, which is again still named as that right now, and he goes to further his studies over there. There, he meets a man by the name of, and I don't know exactly what his name is, because I'm transliterating this name from Arabic. He wrote this book of his in Arabic. He, his name is Niklad Martil, so I would say Nicholas Marshall probably, right? So he goes and studies under this priest by the name of Nicholas Marshall. And he describes him. He says, this was considered the elite. Think about it. He's already memorized the Bible. He's already went through a course of study of six years of the Bible. Then he did advanced studies of the Bible as well. So this is like a seasoned divinity scholar, right? So obviously he's going to have to have someone really elite to now carry on his studies with. So he goes to the top class scholar by the name of Nicholas Marshall. And he starts to study the Bible and he starts to study divinity with him. And he's considered the most religious, the most knowledgeable, the most ascetic. He's describing him in this way. And he says that all of the kings in Europe, they would send all of their questions to this Nicholas Marshall. And they would, along with their letters, they would go and give generous gifts and donations to this man as well. And people would come and they would do tabarruk as well. Tabarruk meaning seeking barakah, wiping the person. Just as some Muslims do this, also in Christianity there are people who do this as well. Right? Saint worship. And this is something that is known to me from someone very close to me who went to the, um, who went to the Vatican as well. He's from a top elite Christian family who then accepted Islam. And he told me himself that when he went to the Vatican, because of who he is, people started to wipe him all over his body and they were seeking barakah from him. So just like that, they're seeking barakah from this Christian saint or priest and they would all wish that this Nicholas would accept their gifts. Everybody's hoping for this. So he learns from him theology. He learns divinity and he starts to also serve this man as well. Service. So much so that priest Nicholas started to believe this young man, he's in his mid-twenties at this point, he started to believe this young man to be a very close aide of his. He gave him his own house keys as well. Now he has access to the top priest potentially in all of that region. He goes to his house whenever he wills. He does whatever he wants. He says, I have access to everything except for one room. The whole house, the whole church, all of the possessions of this priest, well, he's a very wealthy one too. He says, I have access to everything except for one room in which he would keep his treasure trusts from all of the gifts that he would be getting from across Europe as the questions would pour in. And he served him for 10 straight years. And after 10 years of service, Obviously, now he is a very seasoned scholar, right? He's gotten through Bible studies. He's memorized the Bible. He has went and, and really like spent time with the top-notch scholars of his time. And he himself now is considered a scholar, a very senior scholar of Christianity as well. And he says, one day Nicholas got sick and he stayed home. And I went, naturally, the closest student of his, he's going to be looking after the dars, right? The, the lesson. So he goes out and all, and remember, a, a scholar of that caliber, all of his students are scholars as well. So he's, basically all of his peers are scholars. So they get together in this gathering. Obviously, Anselm has a, a special status because of his closeness to uh, priest Nicholas. And... He is sitting in the gathering and they start to debate and discuss the meaning of a word which is debated and discussed till today as well. They all started to discuss the verse in the Bible in John 16, 7, which basically says, It is to your advantage that I go away, 
For if I do not go, the helper will not come. Now, the word helper over here is used. However, the original texts, they have a term that is called paraclete. Okay, or fariqlete in Arabic. Now, this word is, is likely, it was likely, most definitely present in the Arabic Bible as well in the early centuries of Islam. And the reason why I say this is because all of the early sources that quote this John 16, 7 in Muslim tradition, they all use the term fariqlete. Paraclete. But if you look at the current translations that are in the market, they won't use this term fariqlete. They won't use the term paraclete. Nor will it be in English or Latin or any other language. Rather, they will translate it into a number of different translations. Sometimes you'll see the translation helper. Sometimes you'll see the translation uh, comforter. Sometimes you'll see advocate, counselor, Holy Spirit, uh, you know, savior. Different translations, okay? Even in Arabic, you'll see different, the Arabic Bible, you'll see different translations. Some of them, they say, Al-Mu'azzi, the comforter. Some of them will say, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the savior, Al-Munajji. But they don't say, Al-Fariq Liyad. But this man, this elite priest from Spain, from uh, uh, Mallorca, he is saying, I'm sitting in the gathering of the topmost priest of that time, and all of his students are discussing the term paraclete, fariqlete. And they're all asking one another, who is this fariqlete that is to come after Isa, السلام, after Jesus? The one who he foretold. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, when we look at the word fariqlete and we break it down, it, it literally actually means Ahmed. It literally means Ahmed. We know that through uh, studies, we can we can come to that definition, which is basically the ism tafdil, which is the uh, the superlative form that says the most praiseworthy. And we know also in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that Isa alayhi salam, he is the one who comes mubashiran bi rasuli yati min baad ismuhu. Ahmed. He gives the glad tiding of a prophet who will come afterward. His name is Ahmed. Fariqlit Ahmed. But they're discussing, they're talking about it. They're all saying uh, it's this person or that person, and they start to argue. And uh, Anselm says there is no answer. Nobody really had a clear answer on this particular uh, question. And then he goes naturally to his teacher's house and he sits down with the teacher. Nicholas asks him, What was the conversation that people were having uh, as I was absent? So he says everybody was asking about this term fariqlit and what it means and who it refers to and so on and so forth. He said, okay, what was your answer? He said, you know the exigent XYZ, he didn't mention his name. He said, you know the exigent SYZ? He said, yeah, of course. He said that scholar of the tafsir of the Bible, basically, he said that the fariqlit is this person. The priest says, you know what? It's a good answer, but it's close. It's not right. It's wrong. You, you, you had a good try, my son, but the exeget didn't get it right. And then he says, there's only a few people in this world who actually know the meaning of this term, Fariqlit, Paraclet. And Anselm says that I've been studying with you for so long, so he falls on the floor and grabs the feet of the priest and starts kissing his feet. And he says that... He pleads him, asking him, I've traveled from so far and you know, I've been serving you for 10 years and I've been studying with you and I've been learning from you and I've been, and I've been perhaps you can complete your favor on me, O oh master, and teach me what this name means. He starts pleading him. The priest has a heart as well. He starts to weep into tears and he starts to cry. And he says, my son, you are very dear to me because of your service to me. But I'm afraid if I give you this knowledge and it becomes apparent to people in the society that you have this knowledge, the Christians are not going to leave you and they will kill you. So Anselm says, by Allah. Of course, the reason why he's saying Allah is because he's writing in Arabic. Uh, but also it should be noted that Christians also use the term Allah. Like Allah is actually the word for God in Arabic. So all Arab Christians, they don't use any other term. They use the term 
Allah. So if next time some uh, person, you know, who's ill-advised about what Allah means and, and they start to say, your God, Allah, you tell them, well, your God is also Allah. Because in the Bible, it actually says Allah. Many times. On the first page of the Bible, I counted 17 times it says by, uh, Allah. Uh, the, the, in the Arabic Bible, of course. So it's the same thing. So it says, Wallahi al By Allah, the Almighty. And by the Bible. And by the one who brought the Bible. I, he's swearing by Isa alayhi salam. I will not say any of this to anybody. I'll keep this completely to myself. The priest now, he says, my son, you remember the day you came to me from Mallorca? I asked you, in your country, are there Muslims? Is there any Muslims close to you in your country? I said, no, uh, you know, he remembers. And he says, do they attack you? Did they attack you or do you attack them? Meaning, is there war going on between your people and the Muslims? He says, the reason why I was asking you this question was because I wanted to test your level of hatred towards Islam. He was born 1357, 100 year, 125 years after Islamic reign in Mallorca finished. So naturally, you know, the parents and the second generation and the third generation, they would be filling up their children with hatred that these Muslims, they came and they took over this land. And, you know, finally our people, they ended up getting uh, this land back, etc. So he wanted to check this priest that uh, is this individual a hater of Muslims, basically an Islamophobe or not, right? And he says, no, my dear son, that paraclete is actually one of the names of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is he to whom the fourth book mentioned by Daniel, he continues, is revealed. He foretold that his religion is true. His creed is the enlightened creed mentioned in the Bible as well. And Slim is very shocked at this point. He's like, you know, if you know this, why don't you accept Islam? And he says, you know, uh, he says, my master, what do you say about the religion of the Christians? Because obviously now he has all these questions. He doesn't know what to think of Christianity uh, itself because all along, obviously the two major religions at that time as well happened to be Christianity and Muslims and they're constantly at war this is an era in which the, the crusades are taking place this is an era in which uh, there's constant war between Muslims in Andalusia in Muslim Spain and uh, the northern European Christians as well so there's a lot going on and he's really uh, confused Anselm and he says what do you say about the religion of the Christians says, if Christians followed the actual religion of Jesus, they would be upon the religion of Allah because Jesus and all of the prophets followed the religion of Allah. And so he asks the Christian priest, he himself, by the way, is a priest as well. He says, what, what is the solution to all of this? What do you want me to do now? You've given me this knowledge. I don't know how to handle it. And he says the solution, and this is the priest speaking, he says the solution is you go and accept Islam, my son. The solution is that you go and accept Islam. Young Ansel, he asks this elderly priest, if a person accepts Islam, will he be saved? Because remember the whole concept of Jesus being your Savior, so he's like, well, if I leave this belief, am I going to be saved on the day of judgment? And the priest says, yes, if you do this, you're going to be saved in this life, and you're going to be saved in the next life as well. Now, this is really shocking to him. He says, if you know all of this, why didn't you do it yourself? You have all this knowledge of the paraclete that Jesus foretold, and the idea that there's a prophet to come after Jesus as well. And that he happens to be Muhammad and that that is the prophet of the, peop of the people of Islam, the Muslims. Why didn't you yourself accept Islam? Now, the priest, he gives his excuses. He says, you know what? Uh, the thing is, I learned this knowledge not at your age. Remember, Anselm is around uh, his mid-twenties, early thirties. Or late twenties, early thirties. And so, there's a difference between this man and this older gentleman. He's in his 90s now. He says, I learned this when I was too old. 
I, you know, if I had I gotten this knowledge, you literally told them, had I gotten this knowledge earlier on, I would have left everything and I would have went and entered into Islam. And you know, as Jesus says, he quotes Jesus. And this is actually this, one of the statements of Isa السلام, also in the Muslim tradition as well. The love of this world and the love of high status within this world is the basis of every evil and every sin. So you know this is the case. And look at my situation. I have a very, very high status in the eyes of the Christians. I have so much material possession. If I show even a slight bit of inclination towards Islam, the general masses within public would come and murder me. And they would kill me. I would die immediately. And he says, let's say I'm able to escape from the general people over here. And I end up getting to the Muslim lands. When I go to them and I tell them I came to you and I have accepted Islam and they will simply say, okay, that's good for you. You've accepted Islam. That is to save yourself on the day of judgment. What do we have to do with that? Right? Don't act as if you're doing a favor to us. You're basically accepting Islam so that you yourself slave yourself. And I'm 90 years of age. I don't speak their language. If I live amidst them, I'll live as a poor man. I wouldn't be able to communicate with them. They won't appreciate who I am as a human being. I will die of hunger. And moreover, beyond all of this, Allah knows, this is what he says. Allah knows that I'm actually on the real religion of Isa alayhi salam. And I don't follow Christianity as everybody else is following over here. But here's something to stop at. This man basically didn't choose to come to the Muslims because he was afraid that he's not going to get enough support. Now this is an elderly gentleman, but this is a reality even within our times. There's so many people who want to accept Islam, but because we have not enough support groups for new Muslims, we don't have that support. In fact, in the Sharia, we have a rule that is made specifically for new Muslims, those people who recently accepted Islam. And that is that we give zakat to them, we give financial support to them, so that they, are, they get more established within their deen as well. So when you see someone willing to, or attempting to accept Islam, you have to be there for them. And we have to start as a community as well, developing support groups that will allow them. Any person who leaves Islam to Christianity today, believe me, they'll be showered with money. They will be showered with money. That's a reality. And the idea here is not to shower people with money into Islam, but the idea is that this guy sees the truth, but he's afraid. If he goes to the Muslims, he's like, I don't know, maybe I'll die of hunger. I've built my entire life on this. And this is my career at this point. If I go to the Muslims, I will die potentially of hunger. And the Prophet ﷺ actually used to give money in zakat to people who recently accepted Islam. And many of the scholars, they believe this rule continues till today as well, even though some of them, they believe that the Mu'allafati Qulubum, that rule has been abrogated. But I believe that it's a rule that should be enacted even today, that those people who want to accept Islam or have already accepted Islam and they need support, give them zakawat so that they, they will get that support until they can stand on their feet and they become firmly grounded within the religion as well. Now, Anselm, he goes and asks the priest and he says, my master, would you encourage me to go to the lands of the Muslims and accept their religion? The priest says, if you're an intelligent one and are asking and hoping to be see, saved, you're seeking to be saved, then go and hasten and do this. Go to the land of the Muslims because by doing this, you will get goodness within this life and you will get goodness within the hereafter as well. Now, after this conversation finished, the priest, he starts to talk to this young gentleman and he says, look, I've given you this information, but if you take this information and you go out and spill the beans on it and you tell other people in the society, you will immediately be murdered. And on top of that, if they ask you, where are you getting this information? And you say, you're getting it from Nicholas Marshall. I will say, I'm not the one who said such a thing. And I am Musaddaq. People will believe what I say. You're a foreigner. You're not even from here. They're not going to believe what you have to say. I'm the big guy in town. If someone says that, you know, it makes an accusation against me, levels an accusation against me, who, who are they going to believe? You or me? Me. So he says, don't even try that. And he says, on top of that, if you die by telling this information to other people, 
then I am not responsible for your death. I don't take ownership of your blood money. There is no responsibility that I have for your death because I'm sure that people are going to kill you. But Anselm, he gave him all of the reassurances and he promises and he said, don't worry, I'm going to make sure that this information stays completely to me. And he says, you know what? I'm about to pack my bags after 10 years of study over here with you and I'm heading out. And this priest, you know, he really wanted guidance for this young man, actually. So much so that he said, okay, you know what? I will cover your travel expenses as well. He gave him 50 dinars. And he told the 50 dinars is a big number. One dinar is one gold coin, $2,500. So you do the math, right? What would that be? Uh, $150,000 approximately, right? So he gave him a quite a bit of money, a big sum of money. And he told them that go ahead and pack your bags and head out and start traveling. And and slim after many, many years abroad at the age of 34, he now travels back to Mallorca and he stays there for six months. And then he travels from Mallorca um, eastward towards Sicily. And he goes and stays in Sicily for five months. Every month he, and every day he's anticipating that there's going to be some ship that will take him from Sicily to Muslim land, i.e. North Africa. Because Sicily to North Africa is just a day's worth of trip, right? So he finally finds a ship to Tunisia. He gets on the ship. And he heads off from Sicily to Tunisia. And when he lands in Tunisia, all of the Christians in Tunisia, it's a Muslim land, but there's Christians there as well. All of them come racing to the ship and they know that Anselm Termita happens to be over here because remember, he himself is very well acclaimed at this point. He's got a reputation as a scholar of Christianity. Everybody starts racing to get to this person and... He goes and settles down with the Christians. The merchants are there. The priests are there. The religious men are there. The saints are there. They all take him in. And four months, they treat him with absolute hospitality. They give him every single thing that, uh, that money can buy. And he says, they gave me very good hospitality. And they covered uh, my expenses and my life very well. After four months, he says, I asked them, is there any person in the sultan's office, Diwan Sultan, is there any person in the sultan's office who speaks the Christian language, i.e. Spanish? They said, yes, there's a person, his name is Dr. Yusuf, literally a medical doctor. This Dr. Yusuf, he speaks the Christian language, he speaks Spanish, and he is the personal physician for the sultan. And he's also a translator. And he's a very close aide of the sultan as well. So lo and behold, Anselm, he finds himself in the house of Dr. Yusuf. He goes there and he goes and tells Dr. Yusuf the real reason why he, he had come to this country. The real reason why he had come to Tunisia. And Dr. Yusuf becomes overjoyed and he's so happy that in addition to all of the close relationships that he already has with the Sultan, he's going to bring him this beautiful news of a Christian priest converting to Islam as well. So he goes and takes him, he puts him on his horse and takes him to the uh, house of the Sultan. And now they are both standing before the Sultan. The Sultan says that, how old are you, Anselm? Of course, Dr. Yusuf is the translator over here. How old are you? He says, I'm 35 years of age. So what have you studied? What were the sciences that you've studied? Because generally speaking, religious men, whether that be men of religion and Christianity and also of, of Islam, they would, and they still to some degree, know a lot of other arts as well. You, it's, it was part of your studies. You had to study other things as well. So he said, what did you study? He told them, I studied astrology and I studied this, I studied th that. He gave them some things that he had studied. And he said, I studied logic, philosophy. He was very well instructed in philosophy as well. And he says that after this, he welcomed me into Islam. But as he was welcoming him into Islam, Anselm refused. He said, I'm going to accept Islam, but there's a condition. What's your condition? He says that no one leaves their own religion and goes to another religion except the people of the previous religion. They start to say horrible things about him. And they start to make a lot of lies about him. I want you to gather all of the Christians in Tunisia, all of the dignitaries among the Christians in Tunisia, and 
I want you to bring them here. Ask them while I'm not over here, what do you think about Anslam Termita? After they tell you what they think about me, at that point, I'll be willing to accept Islam. So the king smiled and he said, you're asking the same request that the Sahabi Abdullah ibn Salam had asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know the story of Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam was a Sahabi. He was from the, the scholars of Judaism from, the, from Banu Qaynuqa. And he had come to the Prophet Sallallahu He'd asked the Prophet three questions. He said, I'm going to ask you three questions. And these three questions, no one knows the answers of these three questions except for a Prophet. So after he asked him the three questions, and the Prophet Sallallahu answered the three questions, Immediately, Abdullah ibn Salam, he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah and that you happen to be the messenger of God as well. But he says that tell the Jews. He says, Inna al Yahuda qawman buhtun. Jews happen to be very, you know, people that uh, are, are very treacherous. So go and ask them about me before you tell them that I have accepted Islam. So he brought the Jews together and he said, what do you think about Abdullah ibn Salam? They said, huwa khayruna wa ibn khayrina. He's the best of us and the child of the best of us as well. Right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that, what do you think if you were to accept Islam? They said, we seek refuge in Allah from that. He asked them a second time, what do you think if you were to accept Islam? They said, we seek refuge in Allah if uh, he does such a thing. I asked them a third time. They said the same thing. And at that point, Abdullah ibn Salam, he came out and he bore witness that there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. And they said, Sharruna wa ibn Sharrina. He is the most evil of us and the child of the most evil of us as well. And then they started to say all sorts of evil things about Abdullah ibn Salam and they left. So this king, he was obviously well versed in this. He said, you're saying the same thing that Abdullah ibn Salam was saying as well. Perhaps Anselm had this knowledge, he had this information. Maybe he didn't. Anyways, this was the condition he made. And so he gathered all of the Christians together and he asked them, the dignitaries, and they all said, this is... We've never seen, they said, our seniors say, we've never seen anyone greater than him in knowledge and religiosity. He is a person of religion and he's a person of knowledge. And the king says, what if he accepts Islam? They also say the exact, almost the exact same thing. They say, we seek refuge in Allah from such a thing. He will never do this. These are their words. And then the king summoned Anslam, who was told to stay in a back room over there, he came out of the back room and he stood before them and he bore witness that there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger. And when he said that, all of the dignitaries and the priests and, and all of them, they said something slightly different than the Jews with Abdullah ibn Salam, but they said something nonetheless. They said that he's only doing this because he wants to get married. Because they said that the priests in our religion, they don't get married, so he wants to get married and that's the reason why he's doing such a thing. But anyways, their prediction did come true. The Sultan, after they left, he uh, invited a noble lady and he said that I'm going to marry her off to you and he gave him a stipend on a daily basis of uh, a quarter dinar and he gave him a hundred dinar to give to his wife as, uh, as a gift as well. And from that marriage, he had a child and he named that child. What do you think? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He named him after Muhammad. That's why he was known as Abu Muhammad. And his Muslim name became Abdullah and he became known as Abu Muhammad Abdullah at tarjuman the translator. Why? Because after he got married, five, five months into his marriage, uh, everything is going well. The Sultan summons this man and he says, you're going to become part of the naval forces because we need a guy who knows the Spanish language in the forces. So I want you to learn Arabic as well through that. Now, during this time, remember, Anselm is a very intelligent man, 
Right? He's a very learned man, so he's already picked up some Arabic. He's been living here for uh, no less than around nine, ten months. So he's already picked up some language, but he says, now after this job that was given to me one year later, I mastered the language. And he did master it because he wrote this book and I read it. And the book is in Arabic and it's well done as well. You can tell that this is not his first time. You can tell. There's like signs of that. You can tell as an as a advised reader when a writer is perfect and he's almost perfect. So he's very good. But you can kind of tell that it's almost like a second language. Do you understand? So he goes for a year and he learns the language. And this should also tell you as well, some people, they have this lifelong goal of learning Arabic and they don't ever end up doing it. Wallahi, it's completely accomplishable. You just got to put your head down for nine, ten months. You're done. That's it. Ten months later, he became the translator for the Sultan. And he became known in the books of history as At-Tarjuman, the translator. And he started translating for the naval forces. And of course, because of his uh, work ethic, he started going up and up in, into the uh, ranks in the Navy as well. So much so that he became a captain. So now this is Abu Muhammad Abdullah At-Tarjuman, captain Abdullah. Okay, he really literally became known as Al Qaid Abdullah or the Captain Abdullah as well. Now, one day, as he's in these forces, of course, he has to travel because of this sometimes. This is a time of turmoil, remember? The Crusades are happening, Christians are trying to get back their territory, there's fights happening at the Muslim front. Tunisia is literally one of the fronts, right? Because it's the northern side of the northeastern side of North Africa, so literally, this is one of the fronts. So he's at a very, very pivotal area, location. He has to meet these armies that are coming from Europe all the time. And in one of these meetings, he is met with another Christian priest. This Christian priest, he describes him as almost like my brother. Because you remember, he used to be a student of knowledge in, the, in Christianity. And he says that this was one of my close friends. And we went out to seek knowledge together. And he came all the way from Sicily to Tunisia, and the reason why he came was because he wanted to advise me to come back into Christianity. So he writes a letter, this Christian priest, and he gives it over to the interpreter, even though Abdullah is an interpreter, but at this point he's a captain, he's no longer acting as an interpreter anymore, right? So he gives it to the new interpreter, interpreter and that interpreter, his duty is to bring this to Abdullah, and he's going to read it. And in this letter he says, that I'm going to give you all sorts of dunya. You want money, you want fame, you want uh, you know, glitter, glamour, whatever you want. At this point, I have the king of Sicily in my sleeves. I can take whatever you want from him and give it to you, but just come back to the deen of, Masih, of the Messiah. This letter is not given to Abdullah because the interpreter, he feels there's a danger. Remember, this is a convert, so there's like a question mark around him as well. Okay, so he takes this letter and he brings it to the son of the sultan himself. And the son of the sultan brings an other interpreter and he asks him to translate this letter and the content of the letter is clearly inviting Enslam Termito back to Christianity and so they don't want to give this letter to him. But then they bring him. Everybody is afraid. Because they're like, maybe this guy was a spy all along and we didn't even know. Right? So they bring him. And they give him the letter. And Slim, he reads this letter. And he starts to look at the letter. And he starts laughing. Hysterically laughing. The sultan, he, the, the son of the sultan, he's like, why are you laughing? He said, just give me a minute, the content of this letter. I'll translate it for you and bring it back to you. So he went, he doesn't know there's another translation that's already happened of the letter. Do you understand? They're hiding that particular fact from him because they want to test his credibility. Is he really with the Muslims or he's not? So he goes back, he translates that letter, brings it back to the son of the Sultan. The son of the Sultan takes the two letters, he compares them and he finds they're exactly the same. There's no difference. Then they felt more comfortable. And the son, he says, the son of the Sultan, the prince, he says, to Anselm, he says, what do you think of this letter? 
He said, what do you want me to think of this letter? What do you want me to think of this letter? I accepted Islam completely willingly and I will not respond to any offer he makes to me. And at that point, everybody started to feel content and they said, this person is really, really on our side. And he denied all of this fame, all of this glamour, all of this money. He already had a lot of that now, but this was a, 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 even a grander promise because Europeans, uh, they had uh, a fair share of wealth. Remember that region, although it is a region of uh, wealth, it's a region of a lot of khayr for the Muslims, but it is in decline at this point. Europeans are fast making way into the entirety of the Andalusian province, basically, or region, uh, the Iberian Peninsula and the, the, the islands that are related to that as well. So he refuses this offer. And all of this story of his, he tells it to us in a book that he calls Tuhfatul Arib fi Raddi ala ahl salib The gift of an intelligent, to an intelligent human being refuting the people of the cross. And they say this is literally the first book of its kind. It's a small uh, manual. There are various books refuting Christianity. He even quotes some of them. He's, he's read it into the Muslim tradition as well. He said Ibn Hazm has a book on this and Fulan has a book. So he knows the books. But he says no one has actually went to their sources and taken the information directly from them to refute them. So this is like the historical Ahmad Didat basically. Okay. So he takes this information and he puts it together into this book. And we don't have much other information about him. But we know that the scholars of history, they respected the source because they took a lot of the history of that time. Because he also wrote uh, a lot about the kings and the emperors within Tunisia at that time as well. So they took a lot of information about that era from this particular book. And he died in the year 1430. Some sources, they say that he died a shaheed. He died a martyr because he was always uh, at the front. But we don't know that, that for certainty. But we know that this man, he gave up everything that he had. 20 years of, or more of his life, 25 years of his life that he spent studying his religion of Christianity. But then when he realized that the truth happens to be in something else, he left all of that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson for all of us. That there are going to be moments in our lives where we believe something to be the truth. Even within Islam, sometimes there are concepts that happen to be innovations. We might have believed all of our lives this is true. And then suddenly we're enlightened and we're told that actually this one here, this is not according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We have to have the willingness, when we are certain of that, to leave our practices. We don't live by what our forefathers have and we don't live because of our situation and, we're, and fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not make our situation better. This guy's teacher... He chose not to travel. He chose to travel, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the door for him. We're not, we're not saying that that individual may not be given salvation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody has their situation. Whether someone will be granted salvation or not, that's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe he believed internally and didn't express his belief. Anyways, that's, uh, that judgment will leave up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this man, he sacrificed all of this for the sake of belief. He sacrificed all of this for principles, he sacrificed a lot of wealth and status and so forth that he could have amassed with all of the knowledge he had for the sake of what? For the sake of principle. That he is wants to be a man of belief. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept his mention alive for centuries and there is a small mausoleum till today in Tunisia. Although I don't encourage the practices of of mausoleums, but this happens to be the case. There's a small tomb in uh, Tunisia till today under the name of Abdullah. And the people in that region, they know this man as Sidi Tuhfa, Sayyidi Tuhfa, our master Tuhfa. Why? Because he wrote his book, Tuhfa al Arib, so he's known for that book. Okay? So they became, uh, they, they decided to call him by his book, and this is none other than Anslam Termida. And this is, of course, none other also, as he's known as Abu Muhammad Abdullah al-Tarjuman or Sidi Tuhfa. He lived between the year 758 and 832 as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have his mercy on this man. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to allow us to learn the glaring lesson within his life as well. And that is that we should never have, we should never stop from searching for truth. At every moment, we should always be assuming that there is a possibility we have some error within our conclusions. And we have to continue to verify the conclusions that we have. So that when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we meet Allah and we can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, I tried. Every possibility that I saw and every opportunity that I had to seek truth, I continue to seek that truth. The reason why we ask Allah for truth in prayer every day is because we have to make the assumption that we might be faulty in some which way. Why does Allah tell Muslims who are praying in the Quran to read the Quran in their prayer Al-Fatiha and ask Allah 17 times a day Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqim Guide us to the correct path because there are moments and there are aspects of our ideas that may not be correct. That we have to correct. And we have to work towards correcting ourselves until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to correct our affairs in entirety and totality. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een.